very few people who pass the simple grave at the Santa Barbara Mission are aware of his remarkable life and lasting impact on Santa Barbara history. Nicholas Din's destiny was intimately tied to his beloved Dos Pueblos Ranch. Let us go back in history and set the stage. On the 16th of October, 1542, Juan Cabrillo was exploring the California coast for the Spanish crown when he anchored off bluff shale cliffs rising to marine terraces set against the majestic Santa Ynez Mountains. On either side of a lush stream were two large Chumash villages. In his log, the place is named Dos Peblos, and Native Americans had lived there for about 8,000 years. Though he never touched the mainland, Cabrillo was attributed with discovering Santa Barbara. It was more than two centuries later before Dos Peblos saw European contact again. We know a lot about these sites because they were occupied in 1769 when the Portola expedition came through. They described two large village sites, the one that we're standing on here and then one down below. And that's really where the name Dos Pueblos came from, the very name that it's still called today. The expedition only just stopped here briefly. And so what we've done is pour through the diaries to try to reconstruct what was going on. Proceeding westerly along the coast, we journeyed for two leagues in sight of the sea over high hills. We passed through a grove of live oaks and arrived at a watering place situated within a cañada. On the banks is an Indian settlement of more than a thousand souls. The inhabitants immediately came to greet us, bringing us gifts of fresh fish. By the time Nicholas Den came out here, at least on our knowledge, there probably was no longer a village site. And the way we can tell this is from some of the mission records. Archaeological evidence, too. We've looked at the artifacts that have been found at this site, and they also indicate that this settlement was abandoned probably when people went into the mission at 1803-1804. Nicholas Den arrived in Santa Barbara in 1836. He was born in Garadara, County Kilkenny, to Emmanuel and Catherine O'Shea Den. He would later move on to Trinity College and study medicine. And it was there he would receive a letter that would change his life forever. My dear son, it is with great difficulty and pain that I write this letter. We've experienced severe business reverses here in Watford and the Den family is on the brink of bankruptcy. All of Ireland is suffering. I regret that it is impossible for me to finance your last year of medical schools. Recently, we have received a letter from your cousin Felix in Newfoundland. His mercantile firm is flourishing and he has a position available for you. In a matter of days, Nicholas put his affairs in order, taking leave of his grieving parents. In the face of this new adventure, he wrote in his diary, It may be useless for me to insist here that I left my native country with an unblemished character, which I trust I shall ever uphold, no matter to what lands or casualties the Almighty may consign me. Den arrived in Newfoundland in October 1834 to find his promised position in his cousin Felix's firm was no more than his valet. When Cousin Felix handed him a pair of muddy boots one morning and ordered him to clean and polish them, Nicholas threw the boots at Felix and hit him square in the nose. The ensuing fight left Cousin Felix unconscious. Knowing that he was looking at a year in jail, Nicholas caught the first coastal frigate for Boston under an assumed name. 
In Boston, Dan experienced the brutal discrimination against the Irish immigrant. He also heard stories of the exotic land of California, where there was good weather, beautiful Spanish women, a lucrative cattle trade, and a new life. Nicholas had a secret yen to be a farmer rather than a physician, which had been his father's idea. So he signed on as crew on the Windjammer Kent. Den would have observed the Channel Islands as the ship came down the coast to Santa Barbara. The landscape was lush and green and reminded him of Ireland. He was struck by the purple mountains, coastal terraces, and the shale sea cliffs. Den had heard of this pebble, known for its cattle hide and tallow trade. Though many immigrants ventured north to Monterey or San Francisco, few gave thought to the land to the south, which were regarded as the exclusive domain of the Dons, with little chance of any extraneros winning a permanent place among these Spanish blue bloods. But Dan had a contact in Santa Barbara named Daniel Hill. According to Den's daughter, Katerina, Nicholas Den arrived in Santa Barbara for Friday, July 8, 1836. The population of the adobe town was about 900. At this time, the Mexican flag flew above the Presidio, where 15 years before, the Spanish flag waved. Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1821 and took possession of the territories of Baja California and Alta California. It was shortly after this, in 1823, that Daniel Hill, first officer on the brig Rover, dropped anchor off of Rancho Refugio. It was here that the New England native would meet his future bride, Rafaela Luisa Ortega, the granddaughter of the founder of the Presidio, Jose Francisco Ortega. To marry Senorita Ortega, Mr. Hill had to convert from Protestant to Roman Catholicism become a Mexican citizen, and learn Spanish. They married in September 1825 at the Santa Barbara Mission. Daniel Hill lost no time in showing Den the beautiful 15,000-acre rancho, which was now available and only 15 miles from the center of Santa Barbara. I converted to Catholicism in order to marry Rafaela. Now don't mistake me, Dr. Den. I didn't marry into a Spanish family just to get myself a land grant. Nicholas knew it would be some time before he could become a Mexican citizen, eligible for the land grant, so he began farming Dos Pueblos as a squatter. Though the ancient Chumash villages had been abandoned, Nicholas befriended and hired Chumash from the mission to help him farm the land. Ultimately, he wanted to become a cattle rancher, but then knew next to nothing about it. Daniel Hill introduced him to his in-laws, the Ortegas, whose thriving cattle ranch at Refugio became his training grounds. He quickly learned Spanish and soon refused to speak English unless he had to. Although Dan was not fully trained as a physician, when word got out that he had gone to medical school, people began to call on him when ill. After all, he was the closest thing to a doctor in Santa Barbara at the time. Finally, after six years, in 1842, Nicholas Augustus Den of County Kilkenny took the oath of allegiance to the Republica de Mexico. Just a year later, Governor Alvarado granted him ownership of Los Dos Pueblos Ranch. In another stroke of good fortune, Father Duran of Mission Santa Barbara lent Den, a fervent Catholic, the money to buy a herd of cattle. It was a favor Den would not forget. Nicholas Den built a large adobe on Dos Pueblos and was able to propose to then 16-year-old Rosa Antonia Ortega Hill. On June 1st, 1843, they married at the San Ynez Mission. It is likely that Nicholas's brother Richard attended the wedding. He arrived in Santa Barbara that same year. He would participate in many business transactions with his brother Nicholas. 
Dan's cattle business was a big success. The Irishman was now known as Don Nicolás. Dan and his wife Rosa then built another large adobe in town at the corner of State and Figueroa. Eventually, they raised a family of 10 children. Between their two homes, the Dens lived in luxury, and their time together was emblematic of the halcyon days of the ranchos. The home boasted an endless supply of bone china from England, custom made for their ranch. Rugs, loomed in the Orient and the Levant, covered the floors. A music-loving family, they had their own stringed ensemble, violin and guitar players who lived on the rancho. They played often during the week and for special occasions. To sum it all up, the Dens lived like royalty. In her book, Swinging the Censor, daughter Katerina describes her father as a man of fine character and a tender heart. Katerina's narrative of her childhood helps paint a vivid picture of what she describes as the golden days of compadres, comadres, padrinos, and madrinas. The days were punctuated with the daily rosary, church, baptismal, and wedding fiestas. There were elegant bailes where people danced fandangos and jotas, and the scattering of bolo, gifts and trinkets for the children to gather. Nicholas Den continued to prosper in Santa Barbara. As proof, the Hispano-California electorate chose him, a naturalized foreigner, to be the alcalde of Santa Barbara, the most influential position in the district. It was during his tenure in 1845 that the fiercely anti-Catholic Pio Pico became governor and started his relentless campaign to crush the mission system. By 1836, the uh, Mexican government had decided that they were going to sell the missions. And when they did that, Father Duran came to Pio Pico and said, I have uh, located a buyer. And what was really going on, I think, is that he had talked to Nicholas Din and Daniel Hill and felt they were friendly. And while this was going to be forced on the friars and the loss of the land, he wanted it to go to somebody he trusted and somebody who would uh, leave the friars alone in the church alone. My dear Richard, I am just informed that Dr. Esterazzo Andapan, the Frenchman, and Francisco Caballero have made an offer on the mission of Santa Barbara. I do not know the amount, but I charge you of all things not to let the mission go into other hands but mine. I have collected the cattle together, and there are over 1,000 head of horned cattle, 600 head of horses and mares, 2,000 sheep, the wild cat. That sum of mission land will be sufficient to pay for the first year's rent. You must keep a close lookout for the day of sale and get a document from the governor certifying that I am declared its owner. So it all depends on your own judgment how to act. You will give the governor to understand that I consider the mission is mine. I will say no more but leave it all in your hands. So adieu, my dear Richard. If Nicholas Den and Daniel Hill hadn't been able to step in and purchase the lands of the mission, the Franciscans would have lost this site and probably the buildings would have been used as barns as they were elsewhere in California. This, as a result, is the only mission in Alta California that in secularization remained a church and has remained a church throughout its history. On May 13, 1846, President Polk had Congress declare war against the Republic of Mexico. Two months later, the U.S. frigate Congress showed up off the shores of Santa Barbara. Once again, Nicholas Din would take a leadership role as Comandante in the transition from Mexican to American rule, preventing unnecessary bloodshed. The people of the ranchos were famous for their generous hospitality, and it seemed no different when the U.S. frigates pulled into harbor and Santa Barbara surrendered to the Stars and Stripes. Katerina Den describes that day in some detail. It seems to me now that it was also Santa Barbara's farewell to her halcyon days. For the gringo had come, he had come to stay. With the strains of the jota still delighting my ears, the Constitution loomed up majestically before me. 
The officers stood on the gangway as one by one the galaxy of beauty stepped upon the Constitution's deck. I sat in the captain's cabin listening in rapture to the carved ebony music box. The people were dancing on deck, but there was always an officer ready to wind the music box again. The sun was setting. The band played as the boats filled with guests were leaving the man of war. The white cap sprayed the senoritas unmercifully. Not one escaped that American baptism. The Spanish blood and the memory of Spanish days linger like sweet dreams. Nicholas Den continued to prosper under the Stars and Stripes. The historic Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, ceding out the California to the U.S. of A, granted property rights for resident Mexicans. However, they had to prove title to their land grants. It was an arduous process that lingered in the U.S. courts for years. During the gold rush of 1848 and 1849, Nicholas Den became a very wealthy man. It was not from finding gold. There was an awful drought in Santa Barbara, and cattle were dropping like flies. So Den and his brother went north to see about selling the cattle. Up at the mother load, they were confounded to find a steak cost half an ounce of gold for 19 bucks. In Santa Barbara, he sold old steer for two bucks. So he started driving his cattle to the gold country, where he'd get 50 bucks a head. Over time, Den expanded his land holdings substantially. In 1846, he acquired Rancho San Marcos. He would soon add College Ranch to Kepas and Cañada del Corral. He had more than 75,000 acres, including what are now the towns of San Inez and Butte. Though life was sweet for the Den Clan, starting in the 1850s, Santa Barbara went through some dark days. The end of the gold rush brought desperate and disreputable gringos south. Tell them how it was, Doug. Take a little time. Barbara, there were two Irish men, the criminal Jack Powers and the good Christian Den. They became bitter rivals for the soul of the town, and the rule of law almost came tumbling down. Nicholas Den was a rich ranching down in the wake of the gold rush. All the nuggets were gone. From the North King, the outlaws, Jack Powers was their chief. It was a land of rich pickings for the gentleman thief. Jack Powers was handsome and cunning of mind. Had a fine taste in women and horses and wine. He could ride like a demon and he drew just as fast. And cross him that day be your last There was just one saloon at the time of the dance But soon there were thirty brothels and brawls Nicholas was stunned, but he vowed to do battle When he found that Jack Powers was stealing his cattle Dan's foreman, Tom Behan, had the writ to evict And armed deputies, should Powers resist Powers left swearing that revenge would come fast And he ambushed Tom Behan at refuge Jack Powers was handsome and cunning of mind Had a fine taste in women, horses and wine He could ride like a demon and he drew just as fast If you were fool enough to cross him, that day be your last Our 
Harbor's gang was holed up at Royal Borough Beach. They had built them a fort, they were armed to the teeth. Dan went to the judge to demand that this end, and they rounded up a posse of lawmen and friends. Outlaw struck first on a day filled with dread And a shootout on Carrillo Street left three men dead But then had the courts and the law on his side And powers fled south with a price on his hide Jack Powers was handsome and cunning of mind had a fine taste in women, horses and wine He could ride like a demon and he drew just as fast But then made that outlaw just a ghost in the past Eventually things got less rowdy, at least a little less Word came down from Mexico that Jack Powers was killed in a knife fight over a girl. On the other hand, Den was at the high mark of his destiny. Den's name even came up as Democratic candidate for U.S. Senator. But sadly, the Irishman who became a Don was taken in his prime. Despite Den's success, he was still known as Dr. Dent. And on a stormy night on March 3rd, 1862, he was summoned to help a Chumash woman giving birth. He saved the woman, but arrived home wet and shaking. He died that same night from pneumonia. During his 28 years here in Santa Barbara, he brought Anna to his adopted homeland and to his Irish heritage. It is fitting that he lost his life trying to save another. He was a remarkable Irish pioneer. Foreman Tom Behan 